Hello everyone. In this video, I'm going to talk about um, some of the issues that might come up with space planning um, and some things that we need to think about along the way. So with space planning, you know, one of the first things you really need to think about is how much space do you really need? How much space does a client really need? Um, you know, and architects and interior designers do this all of the time and they really help uh, companies and businesses determine what their space needs are you know hopefully and often before making uh, real estate decisions uh, you know square footage isn't cheap so maximizing space uh, is a critical part part of a successful business right so, you know, one of the things you, you need to be thinking about, um, and there are many, is really what the main goals of the space are and what, you know, problems there might be in achieving that. You know, is the goal um, to, you know, have privacy? Is it to work together? Is it to have a, you know, shared workspace? Um, you know, and what could the problems be? Is it small rooms? Is it, you know, poor acoustics? You know, these are all things that we need to think about. So we need specific objectives relating to the intended purpose and functions of the space. And that has to be really clear from the client. What are you designing the space for? Who does it serve? What are the needs? Is it for, um, you know, fun and entertainment? Is it a touchdown space when checking into a hotel? Is it, uh, you know, a computer lab that, um, you know, people work by themselves? Is it a testing center? Is it a community space that all um, has a fundamental impact on how you design and plan for a space? You need to think about the flexibility required of the space, any, you know, special environmental supports that might be needed. You might want to think about atmosphere, right? Is this going to be, you know, a cozy and warm and intimate space? Is this going to be very wide open and dramatic? It all matters and the intention matters. And from the ground up, knowing what the client wants and needs is really critical in how you move forward in the design. The number and types of spaces that are needed and desired uh, is a critical knowledge to know right away. And what's going to be done by whom in these spaces? Is it a private residence? Is it a living room for one or two people? Uh, is it a large work environment in which you need to carve out um, little niche spaces for people to have private conversations and meetings? All of that is really critical to know right away. Thinking about the types of furniture needed, the number of furniture pieces needed um, to perform the required tasks is also critical. If we're thinking about a lobby in a hotel, for example, um, what is the space going to be used for? Is it a brief touchdown space? Will there be entertaining? Is it a lounge? Is it a bar? Um, you know, if we're thinking about a conference room that might be requested by a client, how large does that conference room need to be and what is the atmosphere they want to create? Is it a conference room for six people or is it a conference room for 30 people? Uh, that's all um, very important information to know. So, you know, how big you need to make a space really affects the overall square footage. And generally speaking, square footage is limited. So we need to be very thoughtful about how space is allocated. In the floor plan on the right, we have a 150 square foot office, it's 10 by 15. Uh, it's functioning very well, I hope, um, for the person that uses that space, right? The plan in the middle is the exact same square footage, but with a different configuration, you know, now the person can face out. They have, you know, bookcase or whatever it might be behind them. And this actually allows them to, you know, meet with um, clients, for example. I guess it depends what this room is for, but it functions better for, you know, interactions than the office here on the right. Same square footage. By pushing out our left wall here by five feet, we suddenly have a significantly larger room. We can fit a sofa, maybe a table and chairs and, you know, have a more multifunction space. 
But now we're up to 225 square feet for a private office rather than 150. So depending on the amount of space allocated, how many offices you need to fit, maybe only some people get the 225 square foot office and everyone else gets the 150, for example. Also, when thinking about space planning, we need to think about circulation. So circulation, um, you know, is not only, um, you know, inside of each individual room and how I make our way around furniture, but how we get from room to room, whether this is through walled corridors and hallways or paths carved out, you know, between spaces. But we need to think about circulation. And generally speaking, rooms aren't just butted up where we walk through room to room to get places, right? We actually have hallways and corridors. So we think about those spaces. You know, we really want to facilitate comfortable and interesting and well-designed circulation in rooms and through, you know, the entire space plan um, so that it adds to the function and isn't disruptive or awkward. So, you know, just kind of thinking about corridors, hallways, paths through a space, um, you know, even just within a room, these can have many, many variations, whether it's straight through, turning, curving, zigzagging, or whether there's many paths through a room. Um, this is all going to depend on size, orientation of furniture, and openings within the room. If there's one doorway is going to have a very different traffic pattern than if there's multiple. You know, so just thinking about some spaces like we have here, right, even our image here on the right, we have one opening into the space. So the traffic pattern is going to be such that you flow through and either back out this way or, you know, through the furniture arrangement and out. And so we need to think about the number of people that are going to be in the space and, you know, really how smoothly that needs to flow. Also, while space planning, we need to think about the furniture, fixtures, and equipment that are required of the space, FF and E, furniture, fixtures, and equipment. And this will all be based on client preferences and it may also require that, you know, existing furniture pieces, um, you know, accessory pieces, things like that need to be incorporated. Um, you might need to work around a pre-existing, you know, ceiling design or fireplace. You might need to keep the old furniture a client has. Um, all of that will have dramatic impacts on how you plan a space. We also need to think about uh, the furniture spacing itself and the orientation um, because of the orientation of the furniture has uh, dramatic impacts on human behavior, physical, psychological, social, you know, if we're facing each other, we're going to be, you know, making eye contact, talking to each other. If we're all facing away, it has a very, very different outcome. So it completely depends on the desired interactions of the space. Um, this can, you know, dramatically change whether it's, you know, um, in an airport, whether it's in a lounge space, a reading area where, you know, now we're just sitting on the floor and kind of the idea of sitting on grass. So this can have many different um, feels and outcomes. So another thing we want to think about um, when thinking about space planning issues is proxemics and how close or far apart people want to be in different situations. So first thing we want to think about with that is personal space. So our personal space or you know that kind of invisible bubble that's around us really designates the area that's ours and then what's off limits to nearly everyone else, right? So it's that zone that, you know, when people get too close and invade that personal space, it makes us uncomfortable. Um, it does kind of trigger you and it kind of puts you on high alert, right? So we have to really think about that. So with proxemics, that's the study of the distances between people as they interact and as they interact in different ways. So the study really answers questions about Desirable distances between, you know, for example, um, you know, if you walk in and you see a receptionist and there's visitors sitting across the aisle, um, you know, what's a comfortable amount of space? What's too close? 
what's too far? Um, if you see people sitting across from each other, you know, eating in a restaurant or something like that. So a few examples of um, kind of standard distances. If we think about intimate distance, uh, we're thinking about, you know, six to 18 inches approximately. Personal distance, probably 18 to 48 inches. Social distance, you know, people out and about interacting, four to 12 feet. And then public distance would be 12 to 25 feet apart. We then uh, get into the concepts of sociopedal and sociofugal spaces. So this is really relating to the orientation of adjacent spaces or furnishings that may encourage or discourage interaction. So a sociopedal configuration will promote a face-to-face -face interaction. Sociofugal does allow people to be close together in near proximity, but it discourages um, interaction. It isn't prevented, but it discourages it. So for example, here on the left, these two individuals are sitting on sofas directly across from each other. They can see each other, they can interact, they're facing each other, that's a sociopedal arrangement. Next to them, we have two sofas again as well, but instead of them facing each other, they're back to back. So then the individuals sitting on them are either back to back and not very likely to interact, or they're sitting on the same sofa and kind of have to turn to face each other and could easily just be facing forward. Again, it lessens the, likely, uh, the likelihood of an interaction. So a couple of examples, um, you know, in a real life scenario. So in this image, for example, we are able to get groups of people very close together. Uh, however, if your back is to all the other individuals in the various groups, you're not very likely to actually interact with them. However, because of the shape of the booth, and if you can imagine there'd be some chairs here, you would actually be able to face each other, you're in close proximity, and would be able to, you know, have conversation and interact very easily. Okay, um, in this example down here, this long two-sided bench, you know, allows a variety of people to sit. The arms actually space out and allow, you know, maybe strangers to comfortably sit next to each other without being too close. Um, everyone would face forward. So if you know the person next to you and you want to talk to them, you're nice and close, but you can also kind of get away with looking forward, reading your book, not talking. Likewise, somebody might be sitting directly behind you, but since you're facing away from each other and, you know, have the big booth between you, it discourages interaction. Moving on to some of the architectural features that you might need to think about while space planning. Well, we need to think about, you know, not just a flat floor plan, but what's happening in the space as a whole. We need to think about the ceiling, doors, windows, flooring changes, all of it. So this image here on the right, um, you know, if this room was flat, how we choose to lay this out might be different. But because of these, you know, interesting and large platform stairs that are coming up, we need to maintain you know, a significant distance from this before we can actually lay out our furniture. So that feature is kind of pushing um, all of the furnishings over, as well as this large open ceiling element and all these windows, right? So everything about this room is telling us that we want to be located over on this side of the space. This room um, has a dramatic um, ceiling element, light fixture, that's very, very symmetrical. So it really dictates the rest of the space and these various desks being laid out in a symmetrical pattern as well that's respecting that. Um, you know, if the space was kind of laid out, you know, asymmetrical, it would feel very off and it would feel like the furniture arrangement and the ceiling, you know, weren't, um, weren't getting along. We also want to think about, you know, some of the seemingly more um, simple things that may or may not really show up on the floor plan. Ceiling changes show up, you know, flooring changes show up, but we can also have beautiful wall details, you know, things like the millwork we see here that we might actually want to, you know, locate our furniture arrangements near those and take advantage of 
the, you know, the light and shadow and the texture that that creates, where if that was just a white drywall wall, we might actually, you know, lay this room out differently. We need to think about flexibility and adaptability of space and furniture arrangements. You know, whether it's in a work setting where people may, you know, pick up and move around day to day or groups that are working together may fluctuate in size and, you know, the actual office arrangement may need to be very adaptable where we actually have um, demountable, movable wall systems, lighting systems, things like that. Uh, we can also apply that idea to, you know, hospitality spaces, restaurants, things like that. Um, you know, and in this example, thinking about this long banquette seating, you know, it's set up for tables of two and that works out perfectly fine. But if larger groups come in, those tables can easily, easily be pushed together and, you know, large groups can, you know, sit together um, pretty easily, you know, assuming the tables are open. Uh, with space planning, we also need to be thinking about lighting, both, you know, glare and things like that from artificial and natural light sources. So, uh, you know, thinking about work environments, um, you know, needing to be able to see a computer screen or possibly a TV screen, things like that. Glare can be a real issue. Uh, this particular design has done a fantastic job of having a long overhang over the building. Um, so, you know, we're not getting that glare, but we're still, easy, you know, easily getting all that natural light. We also need to think about artificial light sources um, and how we can have, you know, a glow from diffused fixtures and really bright hot spots from exposed bulbs or just high wattage. And so, you know, thinking about um, that light source and how it's reflecting or absorbing on the materials in the space is very important, um, as well as where they're located. We also have to keep in mind the mechanicals. So we need to maintain access to electrical, HVAC systems, plumbing. So the heating, ventilation, and air conditioning, HVAC, um, can be exposed and very obvious in some spaces um, or built in, you know, to the drywall and kind of hidden in others. But maintaining access to those should something go wrong, things need to be updated, um, is very important. We need to think about acoustics as well. So some spaces will need privacy, will need concentration. Uh, you may have private conversations. You know, you might you might need to have you know um, uninterrupted time for work. And so thinking about the acoustics of the space, what rooms are next to each other, the configuration of those spaces, and how open or closed they are is very important. So as you're you know thinking about um, you know, composing groupings of furniture. Uh, we really want to think about flexibility, the aesthetics of those compositions, and the goals and functions of those arrangements. Whether it's an individual piece, pieces placed side by side, or, you know, sets of three. If we can imagine maybe this was a sofa and a chair, uh, you know, how they can relate to each other across from each other, um, you know, and these kind of geometric groups that we ultimately create uh, with furnishings. So we need to, again, think about flexibility and that aesthetic composition within a space. So if we're working within a very symmetrical space, for example, our furniture arrangements will then also most likely be symmetrical. You know, again, thinking about symmetry and you know, the furnishing, furnishings actually kind of mirroring each other in a very formal space like this, or being a bit more asymmetrical, but still in line and respecting the form of the building itself. Um, and, you know, kind of thinking about rooms, it's not only the, the colors, the textures, all of that that affect the space, but also the furniture, the size, the proportions, and the layout that affect how a space really feels, right? So here on the right, we have, you know, very high contrast, very large furniture in relation to much more kind of petite and smaller framed furniture in the same room has a totally different feel. 
you know, here again, same basic space. You know, obviously the colors are different and, and all of that and the patterns, um, but the size and scale and configuration of the furniture can make the space feel very different. So as we're laying our furniture out, um, and as we begin the space planning process, you know, really the first thing we kind of start to think about is really creating like a 2D pattern with the furniture and what that looks like in the floor plan. Because not only do you see that in the floor plan, like you see here on the left, but we also see that here in the image on the right as well. So of course, not all spaces have sort of an overhead view like this, um, but we do experience what that pattern and layout feels like in 2D in the three-dimensional world as well. You know, so really thinking about what shapes we're creating um, in 2D translates to 3D again. And so, you know, thinking about maybe like restaurants or, you know, larger commercial spaces, we can have some interesting repetition of form, whether it's in a variety of, you know, table arrangements in a wide open room or office configurations in a, a larger setting. Um, that repetition of form applies even when we're thinking about furniture. So, you know, as you're starting to plan your spaces, you really want to think about, you know, what's your overall pattern of the space? How are you relating your furniture groupings to the room as a whole, to the shape of the space, to the floor, to the ceiling? Um, how are you relating to the windows? And is that a symmetrical or asymmetrical layout? Um, there's many things to consider, uh, but it all has a pretty dramatic effect on the feel of the space.